is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 221 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm talking to Ines Johnson all about writing systems and structures in order to help you write four books a year. Last week, we had some lovely comments. Thank you very much to Holger, who said, the Adam Beswick interview just blew my mind. I want to go and do video content right now. It was so motivating. Cassie Newell said, great interview. I'm curious if Adam has business platforms or if he prefers creative platforms and if he sees any differences between the two. When you say business platform, not quite sure what you mean, but he definitely has um, Shopify, TikTok and Instagram. That's kind of where he focuses his attention. Um, Matthew said this was a great episode, fun, chatty, informative. And Emily said, I'm so excited for this one. Adam is amazing. Yes, he is. Uh, And Adam has been uh, coaching me uh, on TikTok and he is the reason that I had a TikTok blow in the last week and it blew so hard and fast (laughs) that it's kind of changed my life. I got about 300, I think I'm just under 360,000 views now on that. Um, So I don't think they quite class that as viral, but hey, it was viral enough for me, believe me, because in 13 days, I had out-earned any month ever. So I earned more in sales, uh, yeah, in 13 days than any full 31 days of any month previously. So this has been a very good month for me. (laughs) Um... Of course, no TikTok virality ever lasts forever. And so uh, there's a wild crash when you come back down to earth. But what I'm hoping is that it levels out at a slightly higher rate than before. Uh, The other thing that it's done is taught me uh, quite a few lessons about independence and um, my business structure. So those books are in KU. But when I look at my KDP dashboard, I am down at 20%. It's hovering between 20 and 21% income from KU. The biggest format seller for me and the biggest portion of my income this month is paperbacks, which is astonishing to me. It makes sense for TikTok because obviously TikTok is a video platform. They are uh, interested in beautiful things, beautiful books because of the visual nature of the videos. So what this made me do was drop everything and start setting up Shopify. So I now have a Shopify for my Ruby. It's all integrated with uh, Book Vault. And um, that is just like start like, well, the funny thing is, even before I've kind of announced it anywhere, it's already getting sales, which is just staggering to me. Um, But it's really made me think about me as a businesswoman and me as a business owner. And, you know, just... I am running Pros in the Market, which is going to be a webinar that I'm going to do three times over the course of the weekend. It will be the same webinar, so you don't need to attend more than once. And it is going to be at different times so that I can accommodate as many time zones as possible. A little bit about the event. Writing to Market isn't new, but when teachers talk about it, they focus on understanding the market, advertising, brand and pitch. But what about the writing and creating? craft of writing to market. If you're tired of trying to work out how to deliver what readers want, then this is the workshop for you. In the session, I'll explain how to deconstruct best-selling books and implement the tools you find. An easy three-step methodology for deconstruction, practical examples of deconstruction and implementation in your own work, why you're not using copywriting enough and where you should be, how to intentionally slip TikTokable, marketable scenes into your novels that will hook readers, the craft of tropes and live deconstruction examples using uh, uh, suggestions from those in the session. You'll also receive a workbook containing exercises for you to implement all of the things that you learn during the session. Now, there will be a, I will record the session, but that recording will only go to people who sign up for the event. So if you can't make it, that um, but you want to attend, that's fine. Sign up and you will get the recording, but I will not be selling this recording. So the only way to join me live for this is to sign up to the event. 
If you have questions and you can't attend, send them to me in advance and I will make sure I answer them live on there. There is a taught part of this, the, the workshop and then there will be a um, half an hour question and answer section as well. So you'll get to come and spend time with me and ask me all the questions that you want. So I'm going to leave links in the show notes to all of those and um, hope to see you there. Last but by no means least, this is the episode before Christmas because the next episode will come after. So for those who do celebrate, I just wanted to wish you a very happy Christmas. And if you don't celebrate, then I wish you a lovely uh, end to the year or, or an end to December. Okay, the rebel of the week this week is Robert Norris. Robert says, it's 1969 and the Vietnam War is raging. I've naively joined the Air Force thinking that might be the best way to avoid being sent up to the front line. Big mistake. I end up being trained in how to use weapons and kill. After basic training, I'm put on the flight line of a base in California as a security guard for the B-52 bombers, the kind of planes that drop tons of napalm on the jungles of North Vietnam. During this time, I have a gut feeling that the war is wrong and I'm listening to songs by artists who agree and are protesting. I'm reading underground newspapers that are finding their way uh, onto the base with stories about war atrocities and the hysteria is running rampant on American colleges. My (laughs) My order to go to war comes about the time the Kent... Uh, state shootings happen. By this time, I've become a member of a group of short-haired hippies stationed at my base, each radically opposed to the war and actively involved in writing for an underground GI newspaper. This is awesome and already a legit rebellion, (laughs) even before I go through the rest of the story. Uh, Okay, anyway, I go to the base legal department to find out what my rights are and what I need to do to file a conscious objector uh, status. Luck is with me when I find a sympathetic lawyer who himself is an anti-war man and spent eight years of school studying to become a lawyer. When he was drafted, he considered going to Canada, but decided he could work better within the system rather than throw away his career and eight years of schooling. He accepts my case and says it's the most important one he's ever had. Wheels, the wheels are set in motion, applying for the objector status. We have meetings every day. He counsels me on how to answer questions that will be asked at various interviews with officers and chaplains who will judge whether or not my application and beliefs are sincere. Not long after, I'm summoned to my commanding officer's office. The commanding officer gives me a final order to go fight in the war. I reply, I don't feel I'm mentally or physically capable of killing another human being. Two guards put me in handcuffs and take me away to the base stockade where I'm kept for a month in pre-trial confinement. Fuck me. The day of my court-martial finally comes on October 6, 1970. The military courtroom is grey and solemn. Several faceless men in nondescript military dress take the stand, pointing their accusing fingers at me as I sit next to my lawyer at a wooden table, facing the military judge. The judge sits in calm repose, weighing the facts of the case as they are presented to him. Military dragon fills the courtroom. The accused was handed his order at one o'clock on the 30th of June, 1970, but failed to report. And so, Your Honour, the full sentence of five years at hard labour is requested to make a lasting example to thee. The courtroom recesses for the judge to make a decision. An hour later, he emerges from a dingy room to call me before him. The verdict, not guilty of the original charge of willful disobedience to a direct, direct lawful order, but guilty of a lesser charge of negligent disobedience to a lawful order, which carries a sentence of six months. In essence, an entire day of deliberation has boiled down to the sentence I used in response to my commanding officer's final order. I never used the word no. It's a lesson in the power of language. That single sentence has saved four and a half years of my life. I spend the next six months at a military prison in Denver, Colorado before being kicked out of the Air Force with an undesirable discharge. As I look back on it now, this experience of rebelling against my government and the war it was that was raging in Vietnam was really the first step on a path to leading me towards an expatriate life and a a lifelong fascination with language and storytelling. That is fucking incredible. What an amazing story and what strength you had to stick to your guns to, to you know, and ha- have to go to prison for your beliefs. Like, it's just astonishing. But like, what a brave, brave human you are. I really, you know, it's testament to you. And thank you so much for sending that story with us. What an incredible story for Christmas. I kind of got goosebumps, if I'm honest. Um, if you would like to be a rebel of the week, please do send in your story. It can be any kind of rebellion. 
rebellion, something big, something small, or something in between. It doesn't even need to be your rebellion. It could be a family member, a pet, and it doesn't have to be a recent rebellion either, as shown by this one uh, from a few decades ago. But please do send them in and you can send them to Becca over on rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com. So welcome and a huge thank you to everybody who joined and upped their pledge, including Angie Green, Kerry Oman and Melissa Sulery. I think that's how I pronounce it. I probably butchered that. And also Marion Hermanson. Thank you so, so much for joining me. And a huge thank you to all of my existing patrons. We just had our last Poison and Prose of the year, which was a proper giggle. We ended up playing Shere- raids <laughs> some of us got very competitive <laughs> It was hilarious, actually. Um, but you can get benefits like the masterclasses. And the next masterclass that we are going to be doing in January is looking at what it takes to become an Amazon number one bestseller. We are deconstructing Right Man, Right Time by Megan. Oh, I've forgotten her surname. I'll tell you that in a second. And also Fourth Wing. We're going to be looking at their marketing, their platform, their books, their tropes, and everything in between. Megan Quinn. Um, And you can also get benefits like the movie nights, the Slack community, and Poison and Prose, which are our live monthly writing sessions. Yeah, more about that by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. Okay, that is it from me this week. Let's get on with the episode. Hello, and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Ines Johnson, lover of fairy tales, folklore, and mythology. Ines spends her days reimagining the stories of old in a modern world. She writes books where damsels cause the distress, princesses wield swords, and mums save the world. Aside from being a writer, professional reader, and teacher, Ines is a very bad Buddhist. I always forget that about you. She, oh, and now I'm going to need, just like last time, for you to pronounce the next Thank word. Us. Sangha. She sits in Sangha each week, and while others are meditating and getting their Zen on, she's contemplating how to use teachings to strengthen her plots and character motivations. She lives outside Washington, D.C. with her two little psychics who are growing up way too fast. And you know what? Like, what? I am a little woo-woo sometimes, but that, like, reading that now, having spent time with you in person, mm-hmm. now tells me why I love your energy so much. Like, it explains so much. Yay. <laughs> anyway, Sandra. hello. Welcome Bye. back. <laughs> so you were last on the show actually in March of this year, which is not that long ago, almost a year, I suppose, nine, no, three quarters of a year. It's so, forever in author time. Oh, uh, seriously. <laughs> it's literally like 14 years, especially after Vegas, which felt like 14 years long. Um, can you tell everyone a little bit about what you've been up to since then? Literally. It's author time. So I've been doing a lot. Um, I launched more courses. So when we were talking the last time, I had just launched my patient or pacing course. and It was really going well. And I, I've been a college professor for 15 years. I think I told you this, that I um, my dream was to become the next Sesame Workshop, the makers of Sesame Street. Oh, wow. <laughs> so like, that was my childhood dream. And um, so I went to school for media production and I got into screenwriting um, I wrote for children's televisions. I worked for, I worked at documentary places like Nat Geo and Discovery. And then um, somewhere along the lines, I started to teach. When I had kids is when I started to teach because I couldn't keep up with the pace. I started to teach. And I taught screenwriting and media production and video editing for 15 years until the writing completely took over. And I was like, deuces. Mm-hmm. And I, I had burned out of teaching. I had, it, the, 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 the quality of student had changed. Sorry, but mm, our generation was the best generation. And some of these students didn't work as hard as I think my generation worked. And I really got burned out because people weren't working as hard as I felt I was working to give them this information. And I, I hadn't taught anything for years. And then slowly I started to teach at um, like RWA conferences and um, just smaller conferences like InkersCon and RAM. I started to teach there and it's like, oh, I forgot how much I liked explaining things. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. And the next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I'm launching a course. And so I launched the patient or pacing course. But since March, I launched some more courses. I launched the writing dirty course and the writing sweet course because I write both steamy 
romance as well as clean and wholesome romance. So I love Yes. Do you know what you've partners. reminded me? I wanted I tried to buy the writing dirty course in Vegas and it didn't work. So I'm putting oh. that on my list because I wanted that. That's gonna That's be my right, Christmas. Com forward slash writing dirty, all in word. Or for those of you that like the sweet stuff, writing sweet. And I also we were talking about how I also launched the um direct to the heart course where I started to learn Shopify in March. And then that next month I launched my store and there were ups and downs. We talked about that too. There were ups and downs in launching that store because it's you You learn how to be a different businesswoman when you are dealing with your own store and you're responsible for your own mm. merchandise. You're responsible for your own customer service. You start to learn different ways of behaving when the buck truly stops at your desk. So I did that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that for a second because like... I really feel when we he when we as indie authors like hear people talking about go direct, do Shopify, we smile and nod about yes, you're a business person. Like as an indie, when you're just publishing books, you 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 hear that you're an, that you are a business person, but I don't think you know that you're an, a business person. And the funny thing is. I have been full time working for myself for four years. And I can honestly say to you, like, humble hat in hand, I only realized this week. And it was a real, like, eye opening, revelatory moment of, oh, fuck, I, I am actually a business person. Yep. And if that is the case, then I really have to compartmentalize the writing and the craft from the tasks that I do as a business person. And it's really hard to like capture what that shift is. But I think, I feel like some of it is about ownership and ownership also means responsibility which means the empowerment to feel like you can charge and to know that you have to have certain things in place and not be afraid of that. Whereas I think a lot of writers don't feel comfortable charging for their craft. And that was like a lightning bolt shift change in the last week when I realized, oh, oh, I am a businesswoman now. <laughs> yeah. Having to deal with all of that stuff will do it to you. Like Amazon has spoiled us. They deal with a lot. And we gripe about Amazon all the time, right? For We gripe about their return policy. We gripe about uh, the KU payout, right? Well, they're handling a lot of our business. Oh man, they treat us. us so, yeah. I mean, I love Amazon. They they have done wonders for us, but, but also they've lulled us into this um laziness I kind of want to say like and that's not uh, I'm not saying that anybody who's in KU is lazy that's not let me be clear what I am saying because I also have books in KU it is a business model and an income stream but the, it's almost like that nannying state where they've handheld us and done so much that actually they've slowly eroded that independence. And I'm not, you know, they've done wonders for us. I'm really grateful for them. But also there's a lot of freeing empowerment in taking contr that control back and having it direct. And even though I've had a direct store on my Sasha website forever, for whatever reason, that mindset shift change only happened this last couple of weeks for Ruby. So yeah. Anyway, sorry, I interrupted you. No, not at all. You know, it's funny. I'm I'm in the midst of doing my like annual accounting and you know how authors start to post like their year and wrap up. And for the last like two years, I've always fallen like $5,000, exactly $5,000 short. No. Of what my goal was. It's crazy. I don't know what it is. My ceiling is high. I'm not mad. But then I, I was sitting down doing the numbers and then I realized, holy crap, I'm still selling direct. I could very easily make that by the end of this month. Yeah, so that was a, that was a great revelation too. But to, answer, to, to finish answering your original question, that's what I've been doing. I've been launching courses and I also, um, because I look at my numbers, historically I go through a summer slump. I don't know why, even if I'm like, even if I have books releasing or... Um, Promos going, the, the summer always slumps for me. So I was like, this year, nah, it's not going to happen. I'm going to do <laughs> something. And I I, I f had fallen in love with short reads. Have you seen that Amazon category? Yes. Books that you can read in like an hour, 90 minutes, two hours. 
And they're just perfect for me because you just need books are all about that emotional journey. Like some yeah. people need to go take a walk and get the endorphins running. No, just read a book. Right? If you can get uh, from beginning, middle, end in like 90 minutes, it, it'll it's also a pick me up. So I've fallen in love with short reads and I was thinking, huh, let me try and do some short reads for my readers because I already write pretty short nowadays. And so I did that as a side project and I did it because I had just started to, a friend of mine had shown me, um, they showed me chat. Cause at first I was like, what is this AI stuff? She coming from screenwriting, my manuscripts look like scripts, dialogue, action, dialogue, action. And then I have to go, I get all the way to the end of the manuscript. And then in the second draft is when I would write the description. <laughs> oh, that's so, no, I do something very similar. You too? Yeah. Yeah. So I always write a short first draft mm -hmm. because I'm all plot, all action, yes. all dialogue. Right? And then I go back and I'm like, wait, nobody is wearing clothes. No one ever is wearing clothes. They're like, always no, like, I don't know. No walls. Know the, yeah, no walls. So a friend of mine was showing me, and she's a screenwriter too, and she was showing me chat. And she was like, she was, I love this uh, software because it really makes me think about the other senses when I'm describing things. And I was like, what? And she showed me. And my brain just was like, I understand this. I like this. This is make this is enhancing my writing because I would go in and say, okay, chat. Uh, my characters are this woman, I describe her, this man. Can you tell me what they're wearing? <laughs> I would I'm just be like it. flipping through fashion magazines or something because I don't know I'm jeans and t-shirt every day, and it would start doing this. But not only would it t help me with what they were wearing, it would help me to just to think about what is the, what does it smell like because that's a grounding sense. It would help me like the touch, the taste, and that just started to explode my manuscripts because I didn't describe that stuff. So what's funny? It sounds like we have very similar kind of like, I don't know, I guess processes, except I'm not words oriented. I'm visual. Mm. So I use mid journey to do exactly the same thing. Interesting. So I get mid journey to create my characters. They don't go anywhere. I don't put them on social media. I don't, you know, kind of, they're just literally for my own personal use. And in fact, you can see it. Listeners can't, but I print them out at the local, like snappy oh. photo thing and just get but you know five by six photos or whatever they're called six by four um and if I'm ever stuck in a scene I will go to mid journey and I'll be like um create me for example I've got this um place called the midnight market which is inspired by Venice so I literally was like right create me a vampire market uh inspired by Venice and then it creates the imagery and then all of a sudden I can go away and write you know because I can see it so I do exactly the same thing using it but um for me I have to see the picture of it in order to then generate my own kind of like Cause like because I have to see it like a movie in my head if I can't see it like a movie in my head I can't write because that's all I do when I write I literally just type the write. movie that I'm seeing yeah. yeah yeah so I love that yes it really it really exploded my writing because already you know I write a lot you know I write more than one book a month <laughs> just on my own and so I got into these short reads because I coming from screenwriting you know I can write a 60 page script in a day but this action dialogue action dialogue but in working with chat to help me to to work through my descriptions faster Man, I I was putting out um a short read a week, and these are like fifteen k to twenty k books, and my readers loved it, and I just I kept it going, and yeah, I've got twelve, fourteen now. Oh, yeah. that is amazing! I have recently found short reads, um, and I've got really high activator, and so sometimes I just and I've got achiever. So um, I've got the start and the finish strengths. So mm -hmm. sometimes I just need to read something quick so that I can start mm -hmm. it and finish it quick. Yeah. Um, and they're perfect for that. So I I love that. Um, I wonder if there are sapphic short reads. I might have to go and investigate that. But anyway, we're actually here to talk about you and all the amazing things that you're doing. Um, and you did kind of mention that you're running like this new mastermindy four books a year thing. So before yes. we kind of dive into like some tips and tricks, do you want to tell everyone um, a little bit how, a little bit how, a little bit about your um, mastermind, what it's called and um, I guess where it came from? So it's called four books a year. And it's not just about the writing of four books a year. And we both know I write more than four books a year, but that's not the point. The point is helping people to get organized because a lot of times I would be at these conferences and I would just be having conversations about my how I, I get up every morning. I'm number one discipline. I get up every morning, eight o'clock, I'm in the chair. I'm writing until 1130-ish or until where the stomach is grumbling too loud and I got to go eat, but I'm getting my worst during that time. And then I become a mood 
writer or businesswoman in the afternoon and I'm either I'm like, how do I feel? Do I feel like writing more or do I want to do a business thing? And then I so make that decision. How many do you write a week or how many do you write a day on average? How many words? Yeah. I don't know word wise. You know, I keep my stickers and I know you love my stickers. My I stickers do. are a reward. I think about chapters because my brain coming from screenwriting, my brain works in scenes. So I know that I can put out four quality chapters a day. Sometimes I push it to like six and the next day I suffer for it. But <laughs> so, and most of my books are between if the, the short reads are always about 15 chapters long. But my um, normal length books are anywhere from like 20 to 30 chapters. So you do the math. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So you were talking about the four books a year mastermind group. Yes. Yeah, so in, it is a mastermind. It's a mastermind where we're dealing with writing, where we're dealing with um, promotions of the frontless and the backlist. And we're also dealing with branding. So I have been a part of Mastermind since I started writing. And a Mastermind, it's it's a group of like-minded individuals, usually around the same level, so that we can all pull each other up together. I don't think it works as well when someone is like a beginner and the rest of the people are like advanced because there's too much pulling up or there's too much like, I don't know what y'all are doing. So I think it works better when everybody is about around the same place, a little bit higher, a little bit lower, but not like a huge discrepancy. And so because I am so number one discipline and I like organization and I love systems, I and I plan in quarters, I said, okay, I can show you how to write a book a quarter. Because remember, my page turner pacing is how to write a book in 21 days. And then what, what do you do after that 21 days? Well, we got to market that book, right? And you got to put up your branding and then you got to plan for the next book. So it's basically me explaining that process over 12 weeks with a little week in between break. And I do it four times the end <laughs> so in that in the i mean it really is that simple it's literally it like rinse and repeat um the, the difficult bit i think about all of this is working out what your process is you know yeah. each of us has a slightly different way of writing a slightly different so here's the thing i am 10 years into this writing journey never have i ever um done a writing sprint that was anything other than a timed writing sprint and in the last week, I've made friends, um, well, no, I've made friends uh, before this, I think in Vegas, but in the last week or so, uh, I have started writing with somebody. And instead of doing timed sprints, we're doing thousand word sprints because we're both fast writers, right? So it can, when we're both on form, I mean, she's a little bit faster than me, but broadly speaking, we do a thousand words every 16 minutes and it has changed my life I have always done um time time like half an hour an hour whatever N this is like revolutionized because the thing that's cracked to me is the words the word count and that's not right for everybody but it's right for me and it's literally just exploded my word count capacity because it's made writing more fun and because it's faster it's more fun for me and so I'm like smashing out 4k here there and everywhere and and feeling like I've got another 4k in the bank because it's been so fun and so buzzy which is just like it this it's it's like when you follow that joy and you find that like energetic I don't know a happy place you can do it more bigger better kind of thing anyway so my point is like everybody needs to find the process and then put the structure in right yeah yeah. And some people do need to do it the other way around. Some people yes. do need to try on a lot of different, try on a lot of different structures because they haven't figured themselves out just yet. I've exactly. known for a long time that I'm a very consistent, very structured, very organized person. So it works for me. And that's another reason that this is a mastermind and not a mentorship. You do not want me as your mentor. So <laughs> and I've had this conversation. We are a lot to take one on one. I would probably send you crying home to your mother. So I <laughs> I work better with people in group settings where I can be tempered because it doesn't make sense to me when I'm like, okay, we're going to go and do a thousand words and you come back with five. That doesn't make sense to me. Or you come back with 500. I'm like, we said a thousand. Why did you do a thousand? <laughs> but <laughs> some people need that though, right? Like they need, like I need that. Like that is amazing. <laughs> we should talk about the fact that like <laughs> you adopted me. <laughs> <laughs> I did. 
<laughs> you did. And and I and I had like a bit of like a, a hot flash kind of anxiety <laughs> moment because I knew that you were number one discipline. But I was like, yeah, oh, okay, no, but I need this in my life. And like you, like I do not fail to do what I've told you that I'm going to do because like one respect, but also like the discipline, the discipline is like this energetic amazingness. Um Thank but, you. <laughs> but talk about that. Like, talk about, you know, because there will be accountability as part of your mastermind. So, like, why does that work? Why is it important to have accountability? Like, how is that going to, like, what's the shape of that? I know for me, well, for some people, it's peer pressure. Um, For me, it's I don't want to disappoint. I said I was going to do it. I'm going to do it. And it almost feels like reputational. Like, I said I was going to do this. And I'm not going to come at you with an excuse because like, I don't want you to come at me with an excuse too, because I might need what you have to give me in order to get to the next step. And I also should admit that I have a bit of a praise kink, which is why I love stickers so much and why I love to reward myself. <laughs> but that's, th these are the things that, that fuel me is knowing that if I know that someone is there and I told them that I was going to do this and they're watching, I'm going to, I'm going to complete it to the very best of my ability. And it's also a support network too. Like you don't, when you are, when you're in a community, when you're in your group, you don't want to let those people down. And even if, as long as people know that you're trying, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to embrace you. They're going to come for you. They're going to lift you up, but they're not going to lift you up. If you just sit down and you say, I won't do it. That's, that's what accountability means to me. It's building community. It's building trust. And it's making you stronger because it makes the group stronger. I love that so much. I don't think there's a single strength that doesn't benefit from accountability mm -hmm. because you can come at it from like the executing strengths in mm -hmm. that I said, I'm going to get this done. Therefore, I'm going to deliver this. You can come at it from the yellow strengths and either that I'm going to compete to get it done when, before I said I'm going to get it done. Or it's that I'm going to perform for you and make sure I deliver for you. Or you can come at it from like the blue strengths, which is all about the connection, the teamwork, the empathy. I'm going to cheerlead and feel for you and that joy and share in that and I just yeah I think that's like amazing yeah mm -hmm. yeah love it love it love it love it love it See, but also but uh, I think the reason that with the, the reason that I've made um four books a year a mem a, mem a, blah, 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 a membership mastermind with accountability is because I do realize that my superpower is my discipline and my my structure and I do realize that I've learned this year that people instead of being afraid <laughs> and running away from my 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 um my structure and my organizing, my need to break things down, they embrace it. And they're like, I didn't think of this way. The way that you just, just explained this really helped me. So it's going to be me handing you the way that I organize something. So every week I'm going to give you um, writing um, examples or, or, or write or craft tips. Every week we're going to talk about how to structure your promo. Because I think about structuring promo first as an annual thing, then as a quarterly thing. And then I break it down week by week. There's something I'm promoting every week. I think about how I'm promoting my backlist as well as how I, I'm promoting my front list. And I've, you know me, Sasha, I've got journals and bullet journals and schedules and calendars, all with how I do this. And I just put it into a nice, neat little form that I could explain to someone else. Here, this is the format, fill in the blanks. And there you have your plan. How many books do you <laughs> think you need in order to be able to do 52 weeks of promotion? That is an interesting question. Here's here, well, here's how I have to answer that. My philosophy is that I don't like to start promoting until I have three because I like to have that first one as a loss leader. So that is my main strategy is having a loss leader because I'm generation X, child of going to the mall and you know we go to we would go to the food court and they would give you um a, a sample and then the next thing you know you're turning around and you're going to eat the whole meal at that restaurant I, I i'm i believe in that strategy so i'm always ready to make that first book 99 cent make it free throw it at everybody so that you buy the next book so i can start with like a 99 percent promotion and then for uh, three months and then drop it down to uh, free and then do something different with it. That's how I think about it. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I'm just not of the one book school. I don't know how to tell you to promote just one book because it doesn't make sense to my brain. 
Mm. Sorry. So, no, no. So you think even with three books, you could still do a promo a week? You could. I, now you, you got me wanting to sit down and map it out. Yeah, no, that's what I was curious. I was curious. Like, See, it's not just it's not just necessarily paid promotion. It's ah. cost per click ads. It's newsletter swapping. It's ah. can I put this book in like a book funnel anthology? So there's something that you can think of. Can I put this book on Instagram? You know how people have Instagram hops and they're also doing like TikTok hops. So what, how can I promote this book every single week? So yes, you could do that. I would pay good money for that as a course, like in isolation, <laughs> seriously, because I, one of my goals, like, I think I've tried to make it a goal like two years ago was to like, try and do 52 weeks of promotion. And after about 12, I got exhausted of trying to think of different ways to do it. But also but you just repeat, you just repeat. So whatever you did in Q1, you have enough books to do it. Whatever you did in Q1 with, with book one of something, you repeat it with book one of a different series for you. Okay. 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 This is not what we're supposed to be talking about. I know. <laughs> we, we are rebels. What I know. Are we about? <laughs> okay. But so you've talked a few times about structure and systems and how important they are. So let's talk a little bit about, like you mentioned kind of like a quarterly cycle. So talk to me more or more in depth about like the systems that are required. What does an author need to put in place really, uh, you know, in order to be able to achieve something like that? Because there's lots of people um, listening who might be like, holy crap, I can only write one book a year. Um, you know, so talk to them um, about how systems will help them to actually reach four books a year. I have to credit Sarah Cannon because before her, I was planning on a yearly basis. And when she, when she, when I heard her HB 90 course and, and she, she just talked about the quarter system that made so much sense to me. So now I have, like I said, a yearly plan and then I have a quarterly plan and then I can go into the month and then I can take that month and break it down into weeks and just being able to compare. I'm a very compartmentalized person and to be able to compartmentalize like that, that was the game changer for me. So <clears throat> what I would tell, like, if you were going to, if, if you were thinking I'm going to do four books, cool. So, and if, you, if you're coming, I don't think that you should come to me with just writing your very first book. I think I would be too much for you. So <laughs> let's say you're writing, you're going to write your third or your fourth book with me. Cool. So we would be, we would be talking about all that differently. So we would be talking about, okay, this is what you need to do to write your, your next book. Okay. Now let's take a look at what's going on on your backlist. I see you have three books there. Let's take one of those books and we're going to just focus on that book for this quarter. Now I'm going to, and then I'll show you tons and tons of ways that you can promote that book. You just have to choose 13 ways to promote that book for it to be one a week. And then, like I said to you, you can just take that plan lift it, copy it, paste it, and put it on the next book. So I think it starts with breaking down your time in that manner, year, quarter, month, weekly. That's be beautiful advice because the fucking ridiculous thing is I've done this now for launches. Like I have a launch template. I have, I have captions for social media posts that I just swap the titles, change a few hashtags, change the tropes out it's um, a and that is a system and I like because I got to the point I think she was like like I, I'm embarrassed to say this but like maybe like my like 17th book launch and I was like why the fuck am I doing this from scratch every single time mm -hmm. and um like hey I only have to learn the lesson one two three four 17 times it's fine Let's burn them up. Yeah. Or it sticks. Yep. But yeah, but like exactly. And I just, why did I not think about that? See, this is this is why we need your discipline. <laughs> <laughs> I um, point out things you already know. Yeah. They are amazing. Like you're amazing. You are gifted at this. Um, Aww. you mentioned you mentioned stickers. Um <laughs> Some of us here might really like stickers. So I don't like, know. I don't know. Uh, and this might be what happens. I, I may have run up to you and gone, oh, show me your sticker collection. <laughs> I love it. I guess. As so I'm literally like getting hot and bothered about all of the like, rolls of stickers and stuff. I will show you my collections. Oh my God. No, oh my God. Oh. 
<laughs> I'm like, I actually like, I like when people send me WhatsApp messages with like photos of their station media delivery, I'm like, you need a trigger warning on this text yeah. message before you yeah. send this to me because I'm like instantly on Etsy, like ordering stuff. Um, but tell me, how do you use stickers? Because I feel like they're stigmatized a little bit for adults, um, you know, because eh, it's a child thing. You get them at school or whatever, you know, like the expectation is that we're serious adults now, but that's such bullshit. And I have boxes of them. So um, talk to me about how you use them. I use them in two different ways. I use them as rewards because, yeah, some people some people will say, yeah, I have to write 4000 words a day. That does nothing for my brain, because then I've, I was going to say this when you were talking about your 1000 word sprints my brain is is always like well what i feel like my, i feel like this is why me and ai got along because my brain i think my i think i'm part cyborg <laughs> because when you said what 1000 word sprints my brain would just be focusing on the words it would not be focusing on the story so that's why it makes interesting right it makes best sense for me to focus chapter by chapter or scene by scene because that is the goal because I know that within a chapter or within a scene, you've got your GMC, your goal motivation conflict. And because I come from screenwriting, I'm always thinking about what particular, what's this, this, the purpose of this scene? So I think about the scene purpose. And also because I come from television, I would have to think about like, what's the twist or the hook because I'm a commercial break is about to happen. And I got to keep them in their seat before um, all, all the way during the commercial and when we come back. So I'm always thinking scene purpose, GMC and the T for whatever that twist is going to be. So instead of thinking about um, word count, my stickers are to reward me for getting the word count because I want to be rewarded. I'm going to write the scene and the scene might be a 1500 word scene. Woohoo, I got stickers for that. I got, I got three stickers for that because I reward myself for every 500 words. But as soon as I put the stickers in there and I've gotten it, I forget about the word because that wasn't the point. The point was the stickers. So what? I use stickers as rewards and I use them decoratively. Okay. So do you, do you outline? Sometimes I don't uh, need to. Okay. So, so that's the thing for me. I outline and in my app, so I, I use plotter and in my outline, I have that structure. Mm -hmm. So I know like the goal mm -hmm. of the scene, like the, the midpoint of the scene and like how I'm hooking out. Actually, funnily enough, um, I don't necessarily know that I do that very intuitively and I will cut scenes yep. where I think it will make yep. people go forward. But my point is, is that when I then get to the drafting, I just turn my brain off my point. Like I was having this discussion with um, another sapphic author today that they felt like um, uh, drafting is the hardest bit because it uses so much energy. And I was like, what? Like I turn my brain off during a drafting it's when I'm editing that I get drained because it takes so much brain power and they're like but it's easy you're already done then and I'm like oh my goodness <laughs> me but so th but that's why I find it so it's so interesting and I think that's why words word count works for me because mm -hmm. I will stop mid-sentence once we reach a thousand words mm -hmm. yeah because I've already got the scene playing so it's like I've hit pause on the scene because I know exactly what's coming next in that scene so I just continue like I just hit play again and then I just continue like it's so crazy I'm not writers we're so weird <laughs> we are we're all so very different we I know are... yeah I, I find this fascinating absolutely fascinating um, you mentioned something else in there that I wanted to ask about. Oh, yes. You mentioned like the cliffhanger and the twist. And I know that you come from like a TV background. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you, like, what tip would you give or like, what advice would you give for creating those, like, um, uh, yeah, those TV, oh my God, gasp moments for like at the end of chapters? Do you have them at the end of every chapter? Do you like put them periodically through the book like ha what tips do you have for creating those shock value kind of moments I think the first thing is all think about I don't I feel like a failure if it took you two days to read my book I want you to get to the end of the chapter and think oh my god I got to see what happens next and turn the page get to the end of that chapter and go, oh what I need to know if I my goal is to keep you turning the page so the the easiest and quickest way that I can explain that one is just sit down and watch TV. I mean, even if you're watching streaming, like you can see when it fades out and it comes back and just think about what it is, like what it is that they do there. And it's likely that they're using sentence structure. They call them hooks and people call them sequels. I don't know where I got this term, but I started calling them buttons. 
<laughs> and what a button is, it's it's basically like the end of a sentence, the punctuation marks, right? So we have question marks. If you ask a question at the end of your chapter, the human mind, it's you didn't complete. I need to know the answer. I need closure. And they think they're going to find closure on the next page, which starts the next chapter. Sure, fine. Answer the question and keep on going. And then maybe at the end of the next chapter, you can use ellipsis and think about what an ellipsis is. It's open-ended. You're not finished. So guess what you have to do? You got to turn the page to get the conclusion. And then you keep going through the next chapter. And then maybe at the next chapter, at the end of it, there's a dash, which is like an interruption. So someone's saying something and then maybe um, uh, someone shouts or something. And you have to go and find out what just happened. Well, really a shout is kind of like an exclamation point, which is like a loud bang going off, which again, then you go and you want to see what's happening. So I like to think of the end of chapters as kind of punctuation marks. So question mark, exclamation mark, um, ellipses, dashes, use periods sparingly because you're giving them a break. And oh, if they take a break, so they might go to sleep. So you literally like dangle them with Absolutely. punctuation. Absolutely. Well, not not I'm, I'm being, I'm trying to be metaphorical. Okay. But with think about what a question mark does it asks it's a question. seen and action wise it's exactly. it's punctuation like those punctuation marks it's punctuation as ask a, a, what wait what do you mean by that and then you turn the page or 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 what do you mean by that he opened his mouth to speak and then you have to turn the page or what do you mean by that well i was about to tell you but then somebody opened the door and someone else is coming in that's like a dash and you have to turn the page we are so often taught, I think, to like scenes must be completed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think this is like the reason I love this so much is because it's breaking that rule. It's like the antithesis to that. Um, and it's and it's freeing because it's giving us permission to like play with the rules and play with structure and do the thing that is the most like uh, enticing um, mm -hmm. to the reader. And yet so often we are taught like this I don't know full cycle come to completion finish things off neatly and tidily and actually that's the wrong thing to do almost like if you want to keep people turning the page I mean uh, you know so I love that I, I think that's such great advice I've never thought I, about it in terms of the I punctuation think people love completion and I do believe in closure but just because it's closure doesn't mean it has to be at the end of the chapter or at the end of the book it could be in the middle of the chapter yeah. And then yeah. you keep going. It can be, the closure can be the second to last chapter. And then you start something new. So you give them that conclusion because we, we we crave the, the, the closure. Otherwise we, we feel unsettled. Like you just took us on this emotional journey and then you, oh, didn't yeah. give us, you didn't give us the closure. Give it to us and then start something new so that we, we, we're, we're on a new journey. You, you're taking our brain and you're like, okay, we got to start this all over again. And you're on the ride because you had a moment of rest. It just wasn't at the end. Oh yeah, complete, completely. You do have to um, like finish off the the subplots and tell them the answers. But of course, you know, so, so the reason that I'm finding this so interesting is that um, for the first time in a really long time, I'm writing a sequential series, which mm. I haven't done in a while. And um, it's proving challenging to figure out quite like what is an acceptable cliffhanger because I've got people telling me to literally cut off midway through the scene. And I'm like, I can't, I feel like I can't do that. And they're like, oh no, you really should. And I'm like, oh God. Um, and you know, the other part of me is like, oh, just bring it to slightly more closure and then leave it. And then I'm like, oh, I don't know. So listening to you talk about that is like really interesting for me because um, yeah, I got some real hard decisions to make in the next week because I'm getting close oh. to, yeah, like I'm over the halfway mark now. So it's uh, that last bit always happens really quickly for me. Um, okay, let's just talk a little bit before we uh, draw the podcast to a close um, about selling direct. You oh. mentioned right at the top of the episode um, that you're selling direct and you started in March and, and it's going super well. Um, but you had some lessons that you've learned as well. And like, we all, we all have to learn some things. So what are kind of like the biggest lessons that you've learned on this journey? The biggest lesson that I've learned is that you need to tell a story. You have to tell a story because you're selling a book. When you're when someone is, is trying to sell a lamp, they don't need to tell a story. They need to tell how it works. What kind of bulb do you need? 
what how big is it how wide is it that's what you need to know what color is it that doesn't work in a book and is that more than a blurb i think so i especially if you're selling to new to you people I try to make my um my I like Shopify. I mean, you can you, it doesn't matter. You don't have to do Shopify. You can do WooCommerce. You can do PayHip. People are selling on their Wix websites. You there's a ton. You can do you can do TikTok shop. There's a lot of different ways to sell direct, but you want to tell a story. And I try to my best sell my best sales page looks like a Facebook ad because that's stopping someone who doesn't know me in their tracks with a story, with a beautiful image that evokes emotion and lets them know this is the type of story that you're going to get. This is the type of emotional journey that you're going to go on if you get this book and put it in your e-reader or if you buy it in print and it comes to your house. This is the this is what I'm promising you. These feelings are what I'm promising you. So you tell that story. And so that's the first thing that I learned because it's, because with Shopify and with a lot of them, you have an image, and then you have the price, the buy buttons, and the blur. That's not enough to sell a story. I mean, Amazon, and even if you go over to Amazon, you see how Amazon has put in that A plus content, and they did that for a reason. And I think we need to, to pay attention to why they did that, because they are attracting readers to come and get a story. So that was the first thing that I figured out. The more I told a story, the more the higher my conversions got. The second thing that um, I didn't even realize I was learning. I only started to re realize this when people started to ask me, well, how, how do I do this? People would come to me and they would say, okay, well, I'm gonna build my whole store. I've got a hundred books and put them all up. I'm like, whoa, you don't even know if this is gonna work first. I'm, I am all for you know charging into the night, but I'm gonna charge into the night with a plan. I'm not gonna charge into the night with my whole arsenal, right? So I started with just my a six book series. I put up the six books. I figured out that I needed to tell the story and then I'm still selling those those same books a year later. So don't start normally I would say start as you plan to end. I'm not going I'm not saying that this time. I'm saying start with a bundle of books or start with something however you want maybe you're trying to sell the um the ebook, the print book, the audiobook and some merchandise. How, however you're trying to sell something that this is the other thing, making sure it's exclusive. We learned that from Amazon too. So you shouldn't, whatever you're selling, people are really comfortable going to Amazon or going to Google Play or going to Apple Books. Try to sell them something that they can't get there. Like you can't get my 13 book series on Amazon because I would be losing money. Yeah. So I'm selling a 13 book series right now. So I come and, and experience the whole world and I'm selling that bundle, but I would recommend like if you have a series, especially if you have a complete series, sell that series get the people love this this idea of binging that's that's one of two reasons that they'll come to your shop they'll come to binge or they'll come because you have something beautiful like people who are doing print with like the foiled edges or something special about the print they are or because you are the one packaging it like i've been watching like one of my friends amy meyer she packages her books up on tiktok and she does it so beautifully i just want the package right so either people are coming to you to binge, they're coming for, and that's probably something that's exclusive, or they're coming for you for something that is beautiful. So take those, that's actually four things. <laughs> Tell a story, um, start with a bundle. Don't try to build out your whole store until you see that it works and it clicks. M know that people are binging and know that people like things that are beautiful. See, the alliteration in me is really upset that we've got binge, beauty, and bundle, and then tell a story. <laughs> so you've got to find another way, another way. I, I will work on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like writing notes. So I feel like, because I have started your course, I'm actually literally taking your course. Mm. Um, and uh, I have started, the reason I started my Shopify is probably in like, um, contrast to why most people start their Shopify stores, which is to try and draw audio and digital and ebook type bundles readers to them. I'm doing it for the print purposes. So I'm undercutting Amazon um, by doing you can buy you can buy that at them the individually at normal prices, or you can do the bundle and you'll get a discount. Mm -hmm. um, and the bundles are across the top. And the other thing that I'm doing are signed ones. And yeah. so because I'm doing signed, I'm charging a premium for them. But the other thing that I'm going to 
do next year is I'm going to follow uh, Angela J. Ford model, her model. I don't know if you know who she is. She writes interracial romance, but in fantasy. And um, but what she does is she sells these stunning book boxes for her books so like she'll do a candle a bookmark a sticker um and like they're all you know print art prints and stuff and she's making a ton um and I think it's a fantastic model and there is nothing like that out there for sapphic readers so I'm gonna create that um okay. and you'll only be able to get it from me and you'll okay. only be able to get signed ones from me and my next series even more so I'm having exclusive um exclusive editions on my store so um color art inside the book map different case laminate art um and then like a just like a I don't want to say poor man's version on Amazon but a poor man's version on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I feel like I'm listening to you um as teacher <laughs> I'm trying I'm trying I'm trying um well, this is the Rebel Author Podcast. So tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. Well, I can tell everybody about about what how I'm about to unleash my inner rebel and gird your loins, clutch your pearls. I have a plan to write 52 books next year. Shut up. Oh my God. Oh my short God. reads in the short reads category. So I am loving writing these 15 to 20,000 word stories. Uh, it's It feels like... Well, one, I get so much joy out of writing. This is what I was, I was, I knew I was always going to be a storyteller. I just didn't realize I was going to be a, a romance novelist. So I, when I wrote those first six short reads in the summer for my readers, I didn't, I wasn't sure if it was going to work. And I said, okay, if I can get these six books to make a thousand dollars a month, I've, i I'm, I'm a success. Second month, they made a thousand dollars. So I said, okay. Um, so I, and I just, I wrote another six for Christmas and it was such so, so much fun. And then I just kept, I just kept going. I kept writing, but here's the thing. Here's two things. One, I am writing with chat because again, I, I write like a script and then I go back to chat. And it's like, okay, help me describe this. It's, and I love it. It's great. It's truly a co-writer for me. And I do it like 400 words at a time. I know some people will go into, I just use chat. Some people will go into, um, Suda Write has story engine where you can just put in all the beats. And again, I come from TV, so I understand beats. You can just put in all the beats and it'll do the whole thing for you. That's not fun. I still want to write the books too. So I'm co-writing with chat, 15 to 20,000 word books. But I, um, because I'm writing and because I'm selling direct, I like having the money come to me the same or the next day. I like having readers give me their information so that I can speak directly to them and not send them to somebody else. So I am going to re be releasing these novels once a week on a subscription platform. I'm doing it on Ream. And so the only, so what I think I'm going to do is you get early access. You get them once a week and you get early access um, with these novellas um, through my subscription platform. That's what I'm doing. I'm so excited about it. And I will let you know how it goes. Yeah, please do. So are you writing, how many full length novels are you going to write? <laughs> You want to tell all my secrets? Yeah, I love it. So, I mean, I am doing a course called Four Books a Year. So those, those, the 52 books are for my sweet romance pen name. Um, and that's mainly what she's doing next year. And I have two other pen names and they each need books. They each need at least four books. So yeah, do the math. You are amazing. I, um, I had set a goal, I think, of five books next year. Um, and you and, should keep that goal. Mm -mm, oh, mm -mm. Lord. No. So my strengths coach, hold on now, because there's, let I me mean, justify this. My strengths coach said, if you don't write five books next year, I'll kick your ass. Because because of my pace, right? Because of what I'm capable of and how fast oh, I can write. Okay. But up until like August this year, I still had like 50% of my time was still freelance. So in August, I reduced my freelance right down. Yeah. So I'm now like, I do like maybe a day a month for them. No so way. I, I, I yeah, didn't yeah. notice. Yeah. So I'm now completely full time. I don't need to do freelance financially anymore, but I choose to do it because I fucking love them. Um, and it brings me joy. Right. So you do the things that give you joy. So mm -hmm. I wanted I wanted to keep a toe in. So, yeah, I do that. Um, but uh, so her whole point was 
you need to put your foot on the pedal next year and see okay. what you're capable of. Okay. So yeah, my original goal was five, but because of this new writing partner, I'm like, oh, bitch, I am capable of so much more. <laughs> and and like, you have I, an accountability buddy. Yeah, exactly. You can also exactly. kick your butt. Oh my God, oh my God you just got hot again. Oh, oh. I, I just, I can never disappoint you. I'm like, I have to be so careful for listeners. I have to be so careful what I can Too late. To. I already heard your goal. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> so yeah, anyway, I, I I have like, we're planning on Monday because um, this person writes a whole shitload more than me. Um, but yeah, my old average was 5K a day. And I think that's going to change because oh, of how wow. fast, yeah, how fast we can com- complete it. And this was, this was a thing that I was trying to explain, like energetically, previously writing 5K a day was hard work because of how we write together. Mm-hmm. Like we wrote 4K today and we got to the end and I was like, fuck me, I could write another four and it w- and I wouldn't even have to break a sweat because of how we're doing and how it's so much fun. I am like, it's like I've taken cocaine by I'm the end of it. so excited <laughs> for you. Yeah. So I am like, what? I don't even know what I'm capable of next year. I'm so excited. So but this is when I get excited because there there's some people that I don't tell my whole plan. <laughs> To, because they just sit and they clutch their pearls and they look at me like I'm crazy when I think this is normal and you think this is normal so yeah but, but th- this is the thing right there are there are different normals and each mm-hmm. of those is okay and like we we have to lean into the things that give us joy and that mm-hmm. are easy for us because they become easier and we are able to like succeed more in that like I really like if it's hard just outsource it except obviously you can't outsource the writing but there are tools out there to make the bits you find difficult easier Mm -hmm. so yeah anyway I don't know I have I'm like really hardcore growth mindset right now so like I'm I'm yeah yeah 2024 we are coming for you (laughs) I love it (laughs) tell everyone where they can find out more about you your books your course mastermind all things so if you're an author, you want to come to anesswrites.com forward slash PTP for patient or pacing, and you can find out about all of my courses there. And you can also find out more about, uh, I have two podcasts myself <laughs> where I like to break down. Yes, Sasha, too. Did we not have this conversation? No. I don't know. <laughs> so I have the Ines Johnson is having a breakdown podcast where I do solo breakdown. I love that. We have this conversation. So much. Where I have solo conversations about breaking down television shows, breaking down books, talking about particular plot techniques, which I just love. And I'm so thrilled that people enjoy listening to me go really nerdy on this subject. And with my book, Bestie, I have another podcast called the Ink and Magic Podcast, where we are doing a deep dive of the 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 series that basically um, brought our friendship back together. We went to college together, then we drifted, and then we started to read the uh, Nalini Singh's Side Changeling series. And we, we, after that, we both picked up the pen. We were both screenwriters. We started writing novels. So it's it's the series that really just kind of changed our lives. And we are doing deep dives of it but because you're talking to two screenwriters or two recovering screenwriters. We really break down the craft of those books. And it's so much fun. That one's called Ink and Magic Podcast with El Penelope. And so are you, you're just focusing on that series or you're going to do other? We do other. So what we're doing, what we're first going through the full side Changeling series. And then we also have kind of these in between shows where we just talk about craft things. Like I was talking to Leslie about um, what I call the Darcy arc, where I think that Fitzwilliam Darcy, Christian Grey, and um, Edward Cullen are the same character. Don't at me, come listen to the podcast and see. And I, I, I sit down and I try to prove it to her and it was it was a great time her favorite um uh trope is enemies to lovers and we break down like what are the requirements of enemies to lovers and what are some of the great books in that so we we one episode will break down one of the side changeling books and then another episode we will talk just craft okay i need to go listen to all of the enemies (laughs) to lovers ones because that is my favorite um and i completely agree with you i do think they're the same character because i think there are certain book boyfriend archetypes Mm -hmm. that 
that certain tropes lean into. Um, and it's funny because I'm just starting to study that and I hadn't really given it a name, but it's like that intuitive breakdown that I died because I deconstruct as well. Um, and I'm doing it for sapphic stuff and looking at what was working and what is working and what I think is coming. So that's... I hope you do a solo episode on that or something. <laughs> I would love to hear that. It's proprietary. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. <laughs> Just mostly because I'm just nerding out. Um, but yes, okay. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And of course, a big thank you to all of the show's listeners and all of the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I'm Sasha Black. You were listening to Ines Johnson, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. To end what has been a fantastic year, next week I'm going to be joined by J.P. Reinflesh the Ninth. What an incredible name and what an incredible episode it was. We're going to be talking all about story hypothesis, theme, and all things craft. So join me next week for that. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.